Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. We're excited to be with you once again to worship our God. Please feel free to lift up these songs with us. I got a feeling you know this one. Sing it out. Oh, we serve a good God. You're worthy, Lord. So mighty and merciful. Let's sing it again. Say, Lord, you are good. Say, Lord, you are good and your mercy. Your mercies endure, endure forever. forever and ever. Lord, you are good. Say, Lord, you are good and your mercy endure forever. Say, people from every nation, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. So good, yeah. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Sing it with us, say. You are good all the time and all the time. You are good. You are good all the time, all the time. You are sing. You are good. You are good all the time, all the time, all the time. You are good. You are. Shout a praise wherever you are. Hallelujah. God, your mercy endures forever and ever. We wake up to new ones every morning. God, we glorify you. Hallelujah. Lord, you are. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good, say. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. See the new every morning, God. Lord, you are good and oh. your mercy endure forever. Say, people from every nation, people from every nation, and tongue, oh. from generation to generation. Lift it up. We worship you. Hallelujah. 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 He's deserving of the highest we praise. Worship we worship you. you. Hallelujah, we worship you for who you 
finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay the last thing I need is to be heard but to hear what you would say word of God speak would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness Word of God speak Finding myself in the midst of you Beyond the music, beyond the noise And all that I need is to be with you And in the quiet, hear your voice, word of God speak would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place? Please let me stay in rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. Would you pour down? you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of God speak finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's all Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Pastor Ashley here, and happy Sunday. Thank you to our worship team that has been leading us into the power and the presence of God. We surely and truly appreciate your ministry. Well, welcome. Welcome, Life Church. Welcome, family. Welcome, friends. And especially welcome to our visitors. We know that there are many services that you could have been tuned into today, and we're so glad that you've tuned into our service. And we do pray that God does speak a word that will minister to your heart while the word of God is being preached. And we want to connect with you, so take a moment and connect with us. Subscribe to our YouTube page, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We look forward to connecting with you. But well, first and foremost, we want to thank everyone for joining us for our small groups this past Friday and this past Saturday. We had a great time. I know us men had a great time in our, in our men's small group, and I know the women had a dynamic time fellowshipping together. It's just great to be able to see each other, see each other's faces, and just to talk and dialogue and get to know each other further. So thank you for everyone who has attended. If you did not have an opportunity to attend, do not worry. We will be meeting again next month. More information will be coming soon. This week, we will continue our regularly scheduled as it relates to Bible study and prayer. Yes, we will be having Bible study Tuesday at 7 p.m. via our YouTube, via our Facebook, or directly via our Zoom link or ways you can join in. Join us as we continue to unfold the topic of prayer Tuesday at 7 p.m. And also join us Thursday at 7 p.m. for prayer. We look forward to connecting with you and praying with you as we seek after the Lord together.
I know many of you may have questions and thoughts as it relates to the reopening of our church as things are progressing in the country and as we know restaurants and many other things are opening up. I know many of you have questions about Life Church and our reopening plan. We are meeting with the Providence St. John Baptist Church and putting our heads together, discussing what is the best way, and format, and plan for us to reopen. More information is coming to you soon, so stay tuned. We are working on it diligently, and you will be informed on our plan and our next steps. And remember that today is Communion Sunday, so get your crackers and your juices ready as we begin to commune and fellowship and focus on the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now it is offering time, time for us just to give a portion to God what he has given to us. There is a number appearing on the screen. Take a moment and give to the Lord. Well, without further ado, we're going to have the word of God by our pastor, Pastor Benjamin Abderrahman, as he continues preaching to us the word of God as we're going through the book of James. I know James has been unpacking and unloading us and helping us walk this faith thing out, and we look forward to it. So get your pen ready, get your notepad ready, and let us go into the word of God together. Remember, join me afterwards for communion and prayer and share. Love you. God bless you. Good afternoon, Life Church. This is Pastor Ben here, uh, and I am excited to be with you all uh, this Sunday for this virtual worship experience. I'm so glad that you all have decided to join with us, and I'm excited about what the Word of God is going to be, and also to break bread with you in communion. Uh, I am going to pray, and then we will dive into the text as we continue in our series, Faith in Action, going through the book of James. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another uh, awesome opportunity to come into your presence and to study your word. God, I ask that you would grant wisdom and that you would grant uh, direction as uh, we examine the text. Lord, I pray you would allow for what is said to connect to the hearts and minds of the listeners so that they would understand who Christ is all the more and how to walk according to his will. Father, I ask that those who do not know you in the pardon of their sins, um, would come to the understanding of who you are and what it means to be saved. And I ask that those who do know you uh, would be encouraged to obey you and to walk according to your way and to your will. Lord, I love you. And I ask that you would allow for me to uh, decrease as you increase, hide me behind the cross as the word takes center stage and it latches on to the hearts of the listeners. Father, we want to live the way you've called us to. And we know that your word is a light and lamp unto our feet in that journey. So we're asking that you would reveal and that you would direct and you would guide and you would strengthen in this time. I ask all these things in Jesus name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, guys, we're actually going to start this sermon off a little uh, different. I want to play a game with you all. OK, we're going to do word association. I'm going to say three words. And then I want you, wherever you are, to guess uh, what they all have in common, all right? Guess what they all have in common and guess uh, the association that they all share, okay? Three words, all right? Now, we're going to start off with sponge, square, and pants. Sponge, square, pants. Give you all a little time. Some of y'all going to tell, tell your age and tell what you're watching by this. Okay. If you guess the association all these have together is SpongeBob SquarePants, the TV show that was on Nickelodeon, you would be correct. And by answering, you would let us know uh, what you watch either as a kid, what you watch now, and some of your interests. Okay. We're going to do another one. All right. Peanut butter jelly. Peanut butter jelly. Okay, give you some time. Think about it. Now, if you guess a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, <laughs> then you would be right. 
okay? And that will let us know what you uh, probably like to fix when you don't want to cook nothing or uh, really don't even feel like going through the process of ordering some food or maybe you don't have the money to order some food, right? So you guys are right on this. All right, all right, now I got the last one, right? Last one, three words, okay? The tongue, the horse, and the ship. The tongue, the horse, and the ship. Okay, I'm gonna give y'all some time. Now, if you guess that that's actually going to be uh, the three things we'll be examining in the text today, right? The sermon, then you would be right. And that means you probably read a little bit further in uh, the book of James chapter three so far. Uh, but that particular uh, combination of words uh, really has more meaning in the context of uh, the, the ancient times where the author of the book of James was speaking. Uh, James, in uh, this book, discusses the tongue, the horse, and the ship. And he is an ancient writer speaking in an ancient context about how horses and ships can reveal to us a timeless truth about the tongue. So the passage we're going to be looking at, which will give us an understanding of these three things and the one message that James pushes to us from this, is James chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. James chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. And it reads in the English Standard Version, For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Now, a little bit of context with this passage, right? Last week, we were talking about uh, how James tells the audience, the believers who are scattered, that not many of them should want to become teachers. And we dealt with the reality that teachers are under a stricter judgment. And they're under a stricter judgment because they are teaching the word of God and they are judged according to what they say and how they live lines up with what they say. So really what James was getting to us was the difficulty of teaching the word of God is actually being in a position where you have to say the right thing and live a life that follows with the right thing, which really hones the real difficulty of being a teacher with the tongue. Here, as we further address the text that proceeds from it, we're seeing James take the concept of the strict judgment of the teacher, which is based upon uh, the words that come out of the teacher's mouth and stretch it further so that it no longer is just applying to teachers of the word of God, but now he's dealing with the tongue as it pertains to humanity. He says in the beginning of verse two, for we all stumble in many ways. And he's not talking about all of us teachers. He's talking about everybody. And we'll see that in the preceding text as he continues to talk about the issue that mankind has with what they say. He says this here. And if anyone, broader context, does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Here, James is beginning and opening up an argument for us about the power of the tongue. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the examples that he lays out in this passage to show us the strength and the power of the tongue, but also give us a clue to how we can actually control it and use it for good purposes. First of all, let's just address what the tongue is according to the book of James, right? The tongue is what we speak or what we say. It's what we speak and what we say, the content of what we say, what we speak. We understand this just from the passage here because in James chapter three, verse two, he says, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. 
Then he proceeds to talk about the horse and the ship to give us deeper insight into this statement in verse two. And he comes back to echo what he initially said in verse five, but give greater detail by saying, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. When he says, so also the tongue, he's referring back to what is said in verse two about what we say and the control we have over what we say. We can also understand that the tongue means what we say by looking at James chapter one, verse 19. Remember, we talked about this. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, right? He talks about what we say. And then later in James chapter one, verse 26, he says, hey, look, if you're unable to bridle your tongue, what you say, then your religion is worthless. Tongue is what we say. So as I use this term, the tongue, I talk about the mouth, I'm really talking about what we say. So James is going right back at it, and he's really going to help us understand the power of the tongue and why it's so critical to our lives by giving us these comparisons of the horse and the ship and how they're structured, right? And our relationship with them and how this actually shows us an understanding of our relationship with our own tongues, with what we say. Let's dive. Verse two and three. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. First of all, let's just have a uh, uh, horse riding 101, okay? And we're blessed here at this church because we have a member, Brittany Logan, who actually is a horse rider, okay? So you guys are gonna look at some footage of, of Brittany um, of riding a horse, right? And we're actually gonna use her for a later analogy uh, in the text. You guys should see this right now, but we're gonna explain some of the terms that James used concerning the horse, right? First of all, what is a bit? B-I-T. A, a bit is a, a, a little steel part of a bridle inserted in the mouth of a horse, okay? It's the steel part in the bridle inserted in the mouth of a horse. So this is what you see when you see riders and you see them on the horse and the horse is biting on something. Their mouth isn't all the way closed. It seems like they're biting on something as they're running, okay? So the obvious other question is what is a bridle, right? Now a bridle is headgear with which a horse is governed. So that's that piece that's on top of the horse's head that the rider hangs onto with reins. So these long straps that they hold onto in order to guide and steer the horse in the direction that the person wants him to go to. Now, here's what I want us to do. Notice the setup here from verse two to verse three that James has given us to help us understand something deep about the power of the tongue. All right. He says in verse two. If anyone stumbles, does not stumble in what he says, right? Then they're a perfect man able to bridle, govern their whole body, his whole body. Look at verse three. If we put bits in miles of horses, let's put that right in the section here with what we say, right? Then they what? They obey us, right? And we can guide their bodies as well. So here we're looking at a comparison, right? The mouths of men, the tongue of men, what they say, what we say, and governing of the body, and the mouths of the horse, right? Which bites on the bit and is controlled by the bridle and the guiding of their bodies. Okay? Let's let's look at this. This this is what this is what this is what uh James is showing us here with this connection, right? First thing he's showing us about the power of the tongue. The tongue is so powerful. If you can control the tongue, then you can control the body. Let's let that sit for a second. I don't know about you. When I read this, this was revelatory. The tongue is so powerful that if you can control the tongue, then you can control the body. I mean, that's the picture, right? That... The same way, the person who has mastery over the tongue is able to bridle their body. A horse who has a bit in its mouth is 
their body is guided by the control of that bit in their mouth. So the control of the horse's body starts with the mouth, with the tongue. Now, before you kind of write that off, that's not that, that deep, uh, Pastor Men. That's not that big of a deal, right? Think about for a second how often we struggle to seek control over the body. Think about how relevant it is that we try to have control and mastery over the body. I, I could just say a couple examples, right? Sexual temptation is one, okay? Trying to, to keep ourselves from giving into urges or things that we know we shouldn't. What about raging emotions, angry impulses? I mean, something that Look, I'm struggling with this well, right? Eating, okay? To, to, to master the body is a real task and genuine desire of many people. And here James is saying that if you can master the tongue, you can master the body. Here's what James is affirming here. He, he's letting us know that the tongue is just a smaller part, part of the body. It's just a smaller part of the body and that the one who masters and has control over the tongue is really exercising a physical strength that can translate to controlling the rest of the body. So, so think about that for a second. If you are exercising self-control over this small part of your body regularly, and consistent, consistently, you are exercising control over your body in a small way. So, oh, I, I want to cuss, but I'm not going to. Oh, I want to speak on this, but I, I really shouldn't right now. It's not wisdom. Uh, I want to lash out with this word, but I, I really shouldn't say it. Uh, I want to overcommit, but I really shouldn't do that right now. I don't want to say anything that's going to get me in a bad situation. When you're exercising that physically in the smaller part of your body, it actually translates to the, to the ability to do it in other aspects of your body. It's as simple as the concept of weightlifting, okay? You always start with smaller weights and work your way up. You start with a smaller weight and you get stronger and can work your way up. And, and, and this is what's crazy about this. We overlook the challenge to be self-controlled with our mouths with what we say because we think that it's not that big of a deal while we're frustrated with the fact that we don't have real control over these bigger things that our body keeps wanting to do. Here's, here's what the, the, the possible inference can be, what, what we can kind of assume, right, from what James is laying out here. If you're unable to control your tongue, you're probably unable to control your body. Th that a lack of control concerning your tongue actually can tell on you about the lack of control in other areas concerning your body. Now, I want to be very clear. I know this is a, a crazy idea, crazy concept, and I don't want to minimize the difficulty of controlling the body. I know many of us, me included, have tried to stop doing certain habits with our body, certain things, and it's not easy. We were doing good for a certain amount of time and we fell off the wagon. So to hear now that, oh, it's just a matter of having self-control over what you say. That's really what the key is. Can sound like there's a minimization that's coming from James about the difficulty of controlling the body. But check this out here. James is really giving us a better picture of how difficult it is to control the body. Specifically in relation to the tongue, which is a small part of the body, right? He gives us a picture of a horse. Now, now think about horses for a second. Horses are strong. They are fast and they're actually considered to be some of the smartest animals in the world. They're literally like top 20 smartest animals. I, I had to work with horses in high school at a stable and what I found as I had to groom these horses, I had to clean their hooves and had to walk them. And sometimes I would ride them was that horses were very keen, very smart and ultimately had a mind of their own. So they would get frustrated. They would get antsy. They would want to do what they want to do sometimes, not which could be not what you want it to be done. 
And anytime it was clear when we were working with the horses that the horse did not want to cooperate, we would always recognize the great strength and power that that horse really had. And the fact that the horse was really choosing to submit to what we we're imposing. But when it started to wild out, we realized that thing is strong. The horse has a mind of its own. And I think James is bringing out a bigger point here about the body and the tongue as it relates to the body. That sometimes, whether it be our tongue or the rest of our bodies, it seems like it has a mind of its own. It's a strong pull. <laughs> We're wanting to go one way and our bodies are wanting to go the other way. We're wanting to go one way and our mouths are saying something else because it pulls us like a strong, cunning, smart beast. How many of us have felt that way before? James is saying, look, if you can master the tongue, you will be able to master the rest of the body as well because to master the tongue is to master a part of the body which is like a horse, <laughs> the strength and the power of a horse. I know some of you guys are seeing that right now. You know, there have been times where a situation has occurred and you're thinking one thing and next thing you know, your body is off to the races like the Kentucky Derby, just gone. It's a difficult thing. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. James paints the picture saying that, hey, if you can have mastery over your tongue, a small part of the body, then you can have mastery over the rest of the body. So you have the tongue, right? And the mastery of the tongue affecting your mastery of the rest of the body. But look at this. There's always a reverse to that because that's what we struggle with most, right? The, the rest of the body affecting what we say. So when we are emotionally angry or hangry, <laughs> sometimes when we don't feel good, our mouth follows the rest of the body. So we, we start to saying things we shouldn't be saying because of how our body feels. This comes from a lack of being able to control the tongue and the many opportunities that we have, which reverses the order and gives us strength to be able to control the rest of the body when whatever those urges are comes up. We deal with the reverse. You know, Stub your toe, you curse, <laughs> right? You, you, you start getting hungry, you're irritable, so you, you, you're wilding out on people. <laughs> you feel off, now your speech is off. You have license to be able to say whatever you would like. This is the strength of the tongue. It can go either way. But it is a reflection of our relationship with our bodies, the mastery of our bodies. James isn't done. He goes deeper. He pulls back some more layers here. When we look at verse four, he starts to discuss a ship as an example to give us more understanding about the strength and the power of the tongue. He says in four, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So what is a rudder? A rudder is a flat uh, piece hinged vertically near the stern of a boat or a ship for steering. So it's the part in the back. And back in the day, it was longer and it was able to be steered by the pilot of a ship. Okay? This small piece steers a huge ship. Now notice what James is doing here. He's kind of giving us a deeper comparison between the ships and the horses. And I think he starts to take some of the implications that we've just gone over concerning the, the, the effect of the mouth uh, and its uh, mastery, the tongue and its mastery concerning the body to a bigger implications when it comes to the mastery of the tongue. He talks about Though they are so large, the ships are large, right? Which is it is substantially greater than a horse, right? So he's he's expanding the analogy to a bigger uh, 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 
vessel, if you will. Now, to give some context to how big ships were back then, we can look at the story of Paul in Acts chapter 27. Paul was on a ship when he was uh, being transported as a prisoner. And it lets us know in Acts 27, uh, verse 37, that there were 276 men on the ship that he was on that ended up being shipwrecked. And the ship had a rudder. Th there's this picture now of an even bigger vessel that's controlled by a small rudder and it's supposed to be pointing to our tongue being controlled or controlling something bigger. I believe that the bigger entity is our lives. <laughs> I mean, you go from the body, right? Or the picture of a horse and you think, well, a body can be fit into a ship, several bodies, right? A horse can be put into a, a, a ship. The, the scope is bigger. And I think what we're looking at here is the effect of the tongue, the power of the tongue to steer our lives. This is what I think the second point is that he brings out with this. The tongue is so powerful. If you can direct or guide the tongue, then you can direct or guide your life. Think about this. It's kind of a progression here. You start off with the mouth as it relates to the body, but then you go bigger because really the implications of what we do with our body determines where we go in our life. And that picture gets bigger when you think of a ship. Think of your ship, right? And, 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 and think of your life <laughs> as a ship. All the people in relationships, that you have on that boat. And, 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 and the ocean is all of the experiences you encounter every single day. Each and every one of us. Our lives a vessel. A massive holder of all of these things that are near and dear to us. Put out on the sea of existence. What does he say? He talks about how. The winds, it's driven by, it's so, they're so large and they are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder, right? The winds affect the movement of the ship. Like it could be in our lives, right? Circumstances affect our lives and move it from place to place as we're on this vast, ocean yet the small rudder still can turn and determine wherever the ship is supposed to go this this takes us back to the power of the tongue because what it's really telling us is is that the tongue has the power to affect where we go with our lives think about it for a second how many people do you know through what they said has destroyed their life? Made decisions. Said no to something that they should have said yes to. Said yes to something they should have said no to. And the trajectory of their entire life is now gone awry. How many times have we thought to ourselves or looked at where we are today and it, it tracks back to one conversation. It tracks back to something we said that we wish we could take back. How many of us have affected or ended relationships because of something we said and it affected our entire lives? This great vessel that's so important to us. It's just like that little rudder. This small part of our lives can affect the trajectory of the big, so, a whole sum of the parts of our life. This is the power of the tongue. Now, remember what I said earlier. The tongue can affect the trajectory 
and direction of our lives. But remember, there's always the reverse. Sometimes the experiences in our lives actually affect what we say. <laughs> so we, like a ship, will be out and we'll see a storm coming and we'll get to turning the direction with what we say, not knowing that we're going off course. That maybe the storm's going to be gone by the time we get to it. Or the winds start rocking and so do our words. And we start to turn and steer what we're saying based off of the conditions. And we get off track. We go in the wrong direction. All because of how we are speaking and how we're handling this massive vessel known as life. What you say is critical to where you're going and what happens in this massive vessel known as your life, known as my life. Now, I know from both of these, we're seeing the power of the tongue to direct and steer our lives, the power of the tongue to be able to display and have mastery over the body. But we're also seeing that it's hard to do that. It, it's hard to control what we say, just as it's hard to control what we do. It's hard to speak and say the right things and make the right choices with what we say so that our lives are directed in the right place when we're looking at the vast ocean of our experiences, we're seeing the, the heaviness and the, the cargo and all the baggage that comes on the ship that's known as our life. It's difficult to control these. So, Pastor Ben, how, how do we actually do the right thing concerning controlling this powerful tongue that would control our bodies and control our lives? Let's go back to verse four. It says, uh, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Think about this for a second. The ship go, goes where the pilot takes it. The rudder turns from the pilot's will. The horse is guided by the will of the rider. And the one who holds the rein. So, so this is this is what's happening, guys. The issue that's coming up with us when it comes to being able to tame the tongue is we are seeing that the word is telling us the way we should be talking, the way we should be governing our bodies, the way we should be steering our lives, but the fact that we won't obey it reveals that. Our will is not aligned with that. That's it. That's it right there. See, the challenge to do what God says exposes whether or not we really want to do it. So the taming of the tongue is not the taming of some separate entity that has no connection to who we are. The difficulty of having the tongue obey say the right things, having the body obey, do the right things, having a life that goes in the right direction is an issue with our will, with what we want, with our desire. Because God has given us the ability to do what? To pilot the ship. To, to have the reins of the body. To be the rider in the situation. So the difficulty we face is the truth that deep down inside, we have to admit that there's a part of us that really doesn't want to do what God says. That, that, that's the problem. That's, that's why, you know, we keep saying, well, how do we tame this tongue? How do we get the body under control? How, how do we tame the tongue so that our bodies are under control, that our lives are under control? How do we tame this thing? We have to get real the part of us that is pushing up against doing the right thing is the issue. 
And that brings about another question, because what's really revealed is, is that the issue or the strength of the tongue has to do with the will of the one in control. And from this passage, it's showing that we are the ones who are in control. So if there's a problem concerning obeying God, that means that we don't want to give the control to the Lord. Somewhere deep inside. That's what our mouth really does, right? No matter what we're saying about how much we trust the Lord or we want to do what God says, our tongues let us know when it disobeys God that deep down inside, our will is not trying to follow. It's not trying to really do what God says. And that's why James points out this idea of the will of the pilot directing, because he's he's showing us that, yeah, the tongue is powerful. Yeah, the tongue can affect so many things in your life. But he's also letting us know that the tongue is subject to the will of the pilot, of the one who's in control of it. So the issue we really have to address isn't so much just the tongue, but it's the desire in us that steers the tongue. It's not just the body as a separate entity, but it's the desire in us that steers the body. It's not just the life outside of us, but it's the desire in us that directs the life in the wrong direction. So here's a question we need to ask ourselves. Yes, we're the pilot of the ship of our lives, meaning we're steering the tongue and it's directing where our life goes. We're the, we're the rider, meaning we are steering the bit and the bridle and it's directing where our bodies go. But the question we need to ask ourselves is who has the reins on us? Who is the pilot of our lives? The difficulty of mastering the tongue reveals that our will is bucking up against God's will. So what is informing and influencing how we live, our will as we direct, as we steer? Think about this. The captain of a cruise ship, right? He's not just out on the cruise steering the ship wherever he wants to go. There's a charted course that they've already agreed upon that he's supposed to go on. And he has to constantly check back into a base where they know that he's going on the charted path they're that he's supposed to because he has a superior. Think about it this way. Even when you're looking at a basketball game or, or some type of sport, you're watching the players play on the field but they're really a manifestation of the organization and the behind the scenes conversations of the coach, of the teams. It happens the same thing with those who pilot airplanes. They're, they're piloting an airplane, but they have to report back to the airport about the, the trajectory that they're going, checking in to see if they're cleared. And they have to have an established path because they're not out there on their own. NASCAR drivers, they drive in the car, but they got someone in their ear, a team in their ear, letting them know what they need to do, keeping them on track as they're driving. Our sister, Brittany Logan, here we're going to look at a video of her uh, 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 steering this horse left and right. And we're going to, to, to notice what's happening while this is going on. Let's take a look at it. Keep What's your kick, 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 look, kick, look, kick, look. Go, 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 kick, 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 she has a team of people who are telling her exactly what she needs to do, encouraging her on making the right moves at the right time. See, see, this is the issue with the will that is in us that does not want to comply with what God says. It's influenced by things that are not of God. So we need to ask ourselves this question. Who is setting out the plan that we're charting on, the course that we're charting on? That's impacting our will. Who is counseling us? <clears throat> Who has our ear? Who is actually leading and guiding the trajectory of our life? Who are we meeting with as a head coach? Our mouths 
are reflecting the fruit of that information. Whether or not it's pointing us to obedience to God's will or not. And this is what we have to get. Yes, you and I are the pilot. We are the writers, but our counsel, our plans, our direction, and our will should be rooted in God's will. Meaning we should be getting advice and wisdom from those who are rooted in God's will. We should be seeking the word for God's will. We should be having our will entrenched with God's will so that when it comes time for obedience with our words, with our bodies, in our lives, there's not this struggle because deep down inside we've been coached to disobey. Bottom line, unless Jesus is at the core of those who counsel us, unless he is our coach, unless we get our game plan from him and his word, we will never be able to truly control the tongue for righteousness control the body for righteousness or our lives for righteousness. This is the key. <clears throat> when I talk about controlling the tongue, when I talk about mastery of the tongue, I'm not talking about just being able to control it for the sake of controlling it. I am talking about being able to control it, to obey the Lord. This isn't mastery for mastery's sake. This isn't controlling for controlling's sake. This is controlling so you can obey God. And the thing we have to get to the heart of is, are we really seeking to do God's will or are we too busy trying to impose our will on our words, on our bodies, on our lives? And that's why everything's in shambles. We got to get out of God's way. <laughs> James is showing us that at the core of the control of the mouth, of the body, of the lives, the mouth which subsequently affects the body and the life is a will. And that will, as believers, has to be submitted to God. In doing this, we are following the example and the pattern of Jesus, who is our ultimate source for righteousness and obedience unto God. Let's look at the, let's look at the text. Look at the scriptures. John chapter 5, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Look, Jesus lays out the example. And if we're believers, we want to live like Christ. So we want to surrender our will to God's will. But if we are constantly receiving counsel and information that infuses our will, then our tongues will tell on us and let us know you really ain't about God's will like you say. Because your mouth is on a different plan than God's. But Jesus lets us know that those who do the will of the Father are part of the family of God. And he lays the example by saying, look, my life was about doing God's will. So that opposition that's coming up in us to God's will is showing that there's a greater priority to our own will. And we need to deal with that and submit and surrender it to God. Why is this critical? Why is this important? This is important because... When we submit to God's will, we are displaying and we are showing the fruit of union with Jesus Christ and union with the Father. And when that happens in our lives, then others can know about Jesus. Jesus prayed in John 17, uh, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may, be, may believe that you have sent me. Your, your tongue, my tongue, your bodies, your lives, my life, my body is an example to the world of us being unified with Jesus. So the more the tongue is leaning towards disobedience, it speaks to a will that's not unified with Christ. And that means the example is not pointing to Jesus. 
But when we are giving so that we have a submission to God's will and living in such a way that we are seeking to obey his will, then we show a unification with Christ, the Father, and that proves to others that the Christ who saved us came from God. That's why this transformation has to happen when it comes to our mouths, when it comes to our bodies, when it comes to our lives. That's why the taming of the tongue for God's purposes is so important. And we have to deal with this issue of our will, which bucks up against that and a culture that would encourage us to turn away from God's will for our lives. The, the great story that we've been brought into as Christians is the reality that man sinned and the image of God was broken and Jesus restored it by dying for our sins and resurrecting on the third day with all power in his hands so that ever, whoever believes in him will be redeemed and what was broken will be fixed and restored. And a part of that restoration for those of us who are in Christ Jesus is how we talk now, how we live with our bodies and how we live all together in our lives. This is why something as simple as how we speak is critical because it points to the divine in us. It proves, it affirms, it validates the divine nature in us. And it also shows that there's strength in the rest of the ways that we steer and live in our lives. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19 and 20 says this, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit with you, within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Your tongue, my tongue, should be a reflection of the redemption of Jesus. Your body, my body, should be a reflection of the redemption of Jesus. Your life should be a reflection of the redemption of Jesus. When we claim that we have been saved by Jesus Christ, it's about more than us just believing that he died on the cross, that we will be saved. But it's about saying that his payment on the cross and him, him bringing us and putting us in right standing with God the Father has changed us so much so that now we are purchased by Jesus, his Holy Spirit in us as a down payment, sealing us, sealing us, this new nature. And now that we are brought into this new relationship, we are owned by the Christ. That means our mouth is owned by him. That means our bodies. That means our lives. And the opposition we see in the tongue obeying is showing that our flesh is bucking up against the purchase that Christ made and it must be crucified on the cross as we surrender to Christ's will. This is what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus in word and in deed, glorifying God just like Christ did in every aspect of our lives. Now, I know this can seem like a whole lot because, yeah, it, it opens up a whole different story when we get to the heart of controlling the tongue and we deal with, well, I have a will that's against God and I may be giving myself over to things that are building up that will to disobey God. That still seems like a difficult thing to do, to get rid of those influences so I submit myself to the Lord and his word. But there's encouragement in the scriptures. There's clarity in the scriptures. I, I want you to get this. And all we're talking about, your will will be purified and cleansed the more you receive the truth, receive the implanted word. That, that's how the transformation, it, it takes place in us so that our will is not so strong bucking up against the will of God, but is obeying, is compliant like the horse obeys. That James was talking about so that we are obeying what, what Christ says. You got to be receiving the word in you regularly. You got to be around people giving you the word. You got to be around those who are trying to live according to righteousness. You got to be receiving it and seeking to obey it so that you can change and live according to God's will. So, yes, I know it sounds like it's difficult, but are we even exposing ourselves to the truth that would transform us? Jesus said in that prayer in, in, in John chapter 17 that, that he asked God to sanctify his followers 
according to truth. His word is truth, meaning meaning make them holier. We are made holy and more righteous by the truth of God's word. And that causes us to be more in agreement with his will. But a flesh, a mouth, a tongue, a body, a life that seems to constantly be contrary to what God is saying is evidence that we're not receiving the truth. And it's not taking root in us that we would obey. The end of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says this prayer. And it's very encouraging because the end of Hebrews is kind of like the whole entire book of James, where you have all these instructions about good things that you ought to do. But then there's a prayer that encourages the listener, knowing that he or she may be overwhelmed about all the stuff that it seems like we have to do. We, we, we feel uncomfortable when we think about how much we can be uh, disjointed from what God's will is and and the great trial it is to try to bring our flesh into subjection to the Lord. But be encouraged, according to Hebrews 13, verse 20, <clears throat> it says here, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good, everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't leave this sermon discouraged because you realize, you know what, something's going on inside with my will and that's why disobedience is taking place. But be encouraged because the same God who raised Jesus from the dead, according to his eternal covenant, can equip you with everything good that you may do his will. And he will work in you to do what is pleasing to him through Christ. The Lord will grant the strength for you to obey. Just admit that at the core of the difficulty with obeying is a part of us that disagrees with the will of God. And when we find that, we need to clean up. Just like it says in James chapter 1. Remove the filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive the implanted word for the saving of our souls. And submit to God's will. We, we, we got to get out the way when it comes to steering these things for our own purposes, our own selfish reasons and being gassed up by the world to fuel our own will over God's will. James shows us, look, there's a lot at stake with how we speak and how we speak. And the tongue has implications that are far greater about our spiritual status than we think and far greater concerning the trajectory of our lives and our bodies. So at the core, surrender your will to God's will. And this prayer at the end of Hebrews lets us know that God has the power to strengthen us to be able to do it. James says an amazing thing, and I'm closing with this. In James chapter four, he says, he says, submit yourself to God. Humble yourself before God that he may exalt you. And it's interesting. He says that right before he talks about not slandering people. And I think there's an order that's shown here about how humility and submission before the Lord and his will strengthens us to obey. But we got to be real with the fact that parts of us don't want to obey. And there are things in our lives that we're allowing to fuel us to disobedience, which is why the taming of the tongue is so hard. The taming of the body is so hard. The steering of the trajectory of our life is so difficult. But we can repent. We can submit our will to the will of God like Jesus and we can walk according to his spirit because this prayer right here lets us know that God has the power to work within us, resurrection power, and equip us to do his good and his perfect will. And he will, but do we want it? If you are in Christ, 
The strength to do it by the Holy Spirit is there. But we got to be real when part of us doesn't want to. And know that that's the battle. Our will versus the will of God and directing that massive ship called our lives. And that unruly beast called our bodies and our tongues. I pray this encourages you and that the Lord will give you strength to be able to obey, to walk according to his will, to exercise the self-control of the spirit by submitting to God's will and presenting a tongue that points to unity with the Father, a body that points to unity with the Father, and a life that points to unity with the Father, that people may know that God sent Jesus and may be saved. Let's pray. Lord God, I love you and I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for how you continually show us the truth of who you are. Father, I ask that you would help us to put to death our will and anything in our life, any body in our life who encourages us to disobey you. Help us to know that you're the one who holds the reins to our lives. You're the one who holds the, the, the reins to, 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 to us, God. You're the pilot of our lives, Lord God. And we want to submit and surrender our will unto you like Jesus did. Father, I ask you would strengthen those who do not know you to walk according to your will and to submit and repent and I'll turn to you, Lord God, but I ask that you would strengthen those who do know you to recognize when their will is turning away from you to submit and surrender their way to you, Lord God, to be real about where they are, Lord, to repent and to ask you to change them. Move in us, Lord God, that we would seek to submit more and more each day in the name of Jesus. You're the pilot. You're the one with the rain. We want to do your will. Forgive us for ever wanting to do anything else. Help us, O oh Lord, to honor you. That as there's mastery over the tongue for righteousness, there's mastery over the body and the life that you may be glorified. I ask all these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, guys. I, I, I'm grateful. <laughs> grateful for this word. This was heavy on me as well. And I pray that you all uh, would stay with us for communion. Get your juice and your crackers. Pastor Ashley will be leading that with us. Consider uh, who Christ is and what he has done. And also join us for prayer and share in the description uh, after our communion time. I love you all and I pray you are encouraged by this word. See you next time. Well, it's communion time. Time for us to focus on the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Communion is so much more than our cracker and our juice, but it is about fellowship. It is about remembering. It is about setting our mind and recalling to mind the sacrifice, the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is about all that he had achieved that we may have fellowship and relationship with God and calling our mind to remember the work of Christ. We can easily forget, but we want to call to mind the remembrance of his work. So our passage today, as we meditate upon the Lord, will be 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. In a familiar passage, but let us slow down and read and reflect on our Savior. And it reads, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray over the bread and over the wine. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, just for the opportunity that we have, first and foremost, to be in fellowship with you. Thank you for the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that you have revealed righteousness from heaven 
through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that the Word was made flesh and the Word dwelt among us and that He preached the gospel to us, to those that were near and those that were afar off, that laid upon Him were our sins, our griefs, our bears, and all of our transgressions. We thank you, Lord, that you, by the work of His cross, by the shedding of His blood, that He has achieved a right relationship with God, that He is the perfect propitiation for our sin, the perfect appeasement to the wrath of God, the perfect payment. Lord God, He is perfection to you. He is righteousness to you. We thank God for the Lamb of God and what He has achieved. We thank Him for the body for the body that you have given to him, the word wrapped in tabernacle in flesh. For you said in your word that a body was laid up for him, that through the body he would do the will of God and achieve righteousness and salvation for us all. We thank God for, and thank Jesus for the blood. It is for the shed blood that which we are cleansed of our unrighteousness and our iniquity, and we are begin to brought in fellowship and relationship with you. Thank you for the body and thank you for the blood and we call our minds to remember remember your sacrifice so father as we partake of this bread and as we partake of the wine let us remember what the lord has done let us remember all that he did to purchase us in fellowship and relationship with you father we ask these things to be done in jesus name amen let's eat together That's straight together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for all that you have done to cause us to have true fellowship with God. We can never repay you for what you have done for us. We can't give you enough. There's nothing that we can do to repay, Lord God, what you have done for us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. We thank you for fellowship with you. And may we always remember Jesus, hallelujah. May we always remember him, always remember the death, the burial and the resurrection. May we always remember the wonders of his person and the righteousness that is available through the works of Christ. May we always remember our faithful and just high priest. We set our hearts to you. We set our minds to you. And as we go throughout this week and the rest of this month, may we do it in memory of Jesus, knowing that we are in union and fellowship with you. And he said, as often as we do this, we proclaim the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for death to our flesh. Lord God, because Jesus died and accomplished the will of God, it gave us strength to put our flesh to death that we may accomplish the will of God. Because he is Jesus, the righteous, we thank you that righteousness is available for us to live for Jesus. Lord, we love you. We bless you. Lord God, and as we go throughout our day, may you always be on our mind. Master, we love you. We ask all these things to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.